Welcome to the monthly virtual infertility workshop. I'm so glad you're here. If you're new, hey, I'm Kristen or Kiki, and I'm an infertility coach. I help women reduce the stress, anxiety, and fear associated with IVF so they can go through the process hopeful, supported, and with no regrets. Each month, I invite an infertility expert to dive deep into one area related to infertility. They share about the medical side, and I share about the emotional side. Sign up at this link to be notified about future infertility workshops so that you can join us live, and you can also get the replay sent directly to your inbox. Welcome to the December Virtual Infertility Workshop. I'm so glad you're here. If you're watching the replay, the link is below for you to sign up and be on the list. That means you'll get notified of all future workshops. It also means you have the opportunity to join the support group that we have afterwards that is not recorded and is something you can only participate in if you're joining us live. Welcome. Let's get started with the December Virtual Infertility Workshop. And this month's guest is Dr. Heather Graham. She is a board certified OBGYN practicing gynecology at Premier Gynecology and Wellness in Charlotte. Um, She's also a fierce advocate of women's mental health, um, especially related to baby making, baby growing, and baby raising stages. Um, She recently started Connected, and we're going to hear a lot more about it today but it's an infertility monitoring location and facility in Charlotte. It's the first of its kind, and it's a way to help patients who travel to see their doctors get their monitoring at a place um, that's facilitated to make it less stressful and easier on the woman going through the whole process. So I'm so glad that Dr. Um, Graham is here, and I'm glad that you're here too. And so Dr. Graham, let's get started. I'm so glad you're here, but I'd love to, can you tell us like more about Connected? Like how did Connected come to be? Come to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me, first of all. And I love that she's created this for you guys. Um, We just kind of stumbled upon each other through social media as well. And just we're very like-minded souls. So it's an honor to get to chat with you tonight and, and hopefully help people learn and just become empowered. So Really, that's what um, where the idea sort of sprang from. Um, I think this year has been nothing but change and nothing about but innovation and figuring out how to do things differently, but still the same. Um, and so, just at some point during the pandemic, um, with the rollout of how I was seeing how we were doing things virtually, just in gynecology, which seems crazy. You never would have thought pre pre COVID you would be doing anything virtually in terms of visits. Um, I realized personally how much I could do by just taking a good history and um, bringing people in if I needed an exam, but um, a lot of times being able to to figure things out just by history. And I know that infertility, while obviously very procedural based, is a lot of history taking um, and a lot of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So um, yeah, just that and, and listening to my patients really just over the years and what they needed and what they were looking for and what would best serve them. Um, one of my close colleagues in Charlotte is an infertility doctor who I referred to commonly, and um, she actually left Charlotte um, recently, and it just sort of spurred me to think about who was there I going to refer to now when my patients needed someone, and I knew that it, she was a very popular um, infertility doc and that patients deserved to still get to see her if they wanted, and um, started thinking more about how with the pandemic, that must be awfully hard on people that was traveling. And um, the idea of creating something locally for local monitoring just sort of um, came to came to fruition. Um, yeah, one step at a time. So um, we named it Connected, just because that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I wanted the name to have sort of the essence of what I'm trying to do. I'm not in any way at all. I mean, general gynecologist and obstetrician. So not replacing an infertility doctor and their expertise is merely just connecting a patient to the doctor that they love um, in the most convenient way possible. So that's where the name connected came from. (laughs) I love it. And I love that you said that too, because that's as the infertility coach, like I am trying to work alongside the woman when she's going through 
getting the treatment from the experts who went to lots and lots and lots of schooling for right. what they do. Um, and I so three more years of training after I did, I got out. <laughs> for that, so. <laughs> I was ready for a job. <laughs> but it's good to say that like, um, and we've talked about this before, but it's like having a team. And so you're a part of the team. I can be a part of the team and together it's like, yeah. you know, when you feel so isolated going through infertility, it's, it's actually the total opposite because you can have this team of experts with you from different facets, you yeah. know, with acupuncture and nutritionists as well, mm-hmm. um, the whole gamut. Yeah. So, um, launching, um, in 2021, which is gosh, going to be <laughs> this I know. <laughs> like any minute now. And, you know, it's for people in Charlotte and we may have people joining us from, I don't know, another state or something. So it might not be for everyone, but the idea is, is still central, hopefully. And, something in other states or other cities um, that hopefully have similar services. So hopefully just explaining that a bit more tonight will help educate and empower people about what they can at least ask for and look for if they are pursuing treatment somewhere else and make it easier on you. So, well, that's a really good segue into my question for you is (laughs) what, so, well, I think we should take a step back um, because sometimes people go to the infertility practice that's in their town or the closest And it's just because that's what they know when they go to it. Um, And sometimes people know that there are options, like they can go out and sometimes you're limited based on your budget or sometimes you're limited based on your insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the things that when somebody is looking that they should be um, like asking? Yeah. If they're not going to be close by. Yeah. Um, So I think, you know, like you said, there's various reasons people choose maybe to pursue treatment somewhere else. Maybe it's the reputation of the clinic. Maybe they didn't click with their um, the clinicians or the staff or for whatever reason, or maybe they had a bad outcome. You know, that happens often just in the plan world that people change to me and I'm sure change away from my office just because there's something about the environment itself that's just triggering and they need a fresh start sometimes when they're starting a fresh cycle. So Lots and lots of reasons. Um, you know, I think most infertility docs um, in my sort of research looking and um, communicating with some of the larger clinics are, are very open to, yeah, we, we've figured out how to do this thing remote as well. And I think we're even doing it pre-COVID, um, maybe more doing the initial consult in person, but trying to limit um trips out of town to just procedures um, and trying to keep more of the monitoring that either a lot of you may know about or maybe about to go through, but simply means um, ultrasounds um, and blood work that kind of monitor in a cycle um, where you're at, what's going on and help the smart doctors like Dr. Likes figure out what to do <laughs> with your treatment um, and, when, and when to you know um, change course, uh, stay the course, so forth. It's very important to them that, again, um, people like me are in no way trying to intercede and would just um, basically facilitate having it locally, um, conveniently, and then having, you know, very clear, direct communication back to that person that's going to make management decisions um, without patients having to get caught in the middle of I got to get my labs back. I got to get the clinic to answer the phone. They need them back today. We got to make a treatment decision. And I can't even imagine what that must be like. So just trying to simplify. Well, I can tell you, and that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you is because I, when I was going through my IVF process, I did not go to the closest doctor. I passed the clinic on my way to go to the one I want to, um, because I did research Mm -hmm. And I, there were things that I knew that I cared about. Um, I knew that the lab was a really big deal Mm -hmm. and, um, what was going on in their processes with the lab meant a lot to me. We paid out of pocket. So I, while I didn't have limitations on my insurance saying where I could or couldn't go. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did travel for my doctor and I'm happy. I'm very happy with that decision. And, um, and I know that sometimes like I went to local monitoring at my OBGYN office mm-hmm. and it was awesome because I was so close with them and I was such yes. good friends with them that it made that part was so easy. It was really nice mm-hmm. to be able to see the same person. Like I could literally text yeah. the person and say, Hey, I need an ultrasound tomorrow morning. Like how soon can you get me in? And that means a lot. 
but I would have to then do blood work. And I changed it every time because different places where I lived had different turnaround times and couldn't do the blood work responses. Like, yeah. and again, I don't know the technical terms, but like they could not get the information back to the well, you know. eye doctor fast mm-hmm. enough to know, well, do I up my goggle F pen tonight or do I not? Like, I, I have no idea. And so I would call, I would like sweet talk them. Y'all let me know if you've done this too, where you're like, you're sweet talking them and you're like trying to become their best friend because you want them to like you because you want them to put whatever stat sticker needs to go on that blood vial to like do the thing. Like I brought breakfast. I mean, I was doing all of the things yeah, like I literally was calling and be like, Hey, did you send it over yet? And then, I mean, fax machines, why do we still use fax machines? Like, Oh, we didn't get the fax. And it's yeah. you know, four more phone calls that I had to make on top of infertility. That's already so unsettling and like nothing goes in this right order. And it just, it was another layer. And for those women who follow me, they know I don't like to pee on us. I don't encourage peeing on a stick during the two week wait, because I think it adds an extra level of like dips and uncertainty. And I don't support that. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was what I was doing with this outside monitoring was I was adding more dips and more layers that could have been avoided if a place like connected was there. And the other thing I want to say about it because of my experience was that I had to go to the OBGYN's office and yeah. you girls, you know, like sometimes seeing a pregnant woman or a woman who has three children and has the big bump yeah. waiting in the waiting room is not what you need to see. Yeah. It's not what I needed to see. Yeah. There were days where I was literally like holding back the tears from being yeah. more emotional because that woman, you know, had, was popping babies left and right. And I was doing everything I could. And my first round failed and it was like, when's my turn. And that was a big trigger. And so Heather, I would love for you to talk about literally, Mm -hmm. um, like I would love for you to talk about how a woman will actually go into your practice and what that will be like, because I think you're answering that challenge that I had. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, the, the space is going to be a, a small, just sort of private space, um, with early morning appointments, just to facilitate this whole, um, concept of getting it back quickly. And because a lot of us work, you know, so you, you're going to have lots of monitoring and, um, maybe hopefully helps cut down on, on time, um, um, away from work and time off, you know, to get everything done before maybe even eight o'clock hit. So, there's gonna be like um, early morning appointments just to facilitate that process. Um, and very private too, like I said, just small and manageable so that we can not make people feel like they're a number and that their information gets communicated very quickly. Um, and um, yeah, the lab piece actually, as I was putting everything together, I knew the ultrasound um, from having done that part in my practice, um, was going to be the easy part, so to speak, maybe the most expensive part, but the easiest part, um, of putting the business together. But the lab was what surprised me. Um, and I guess I should have known, cause I've had patients ask me over the years, can you do some of the monitoring? And as I looked into it, I realized a lot of them weren't stat labs that we had at our facility. So while we could have done the ultrasound monitoring, I knew that personally where I had been previously, just, it didn't have the capability to do stat monitoring that I was at least aware of or had ever had the time to pursue finding out um, in a busy practice. So I spent some time talking to lab companies and um, I want to have an in-house phlebotomist that's just right there, takes your blood right after the appointment and done. That's still coming. Um, For now, if, if things start swiftly and in January, the facility is within a quarter of a mile. So just drive down the road and walk into the lab and, and have it done in their, um, a quick turnaround time. I have a personal account or, um, some infertility doctors, it's a common lab company that, you know, maybe just can log in themselves. Um, so just going to try to streamline that, but honestly, I'm a not communicating well as my pet peeve in medicine. So, um, I want to know your infertility doctor. Like I want to be able to have, uh, their cell phone number such that if the faxes are down or whatever, I can just be like, can I verbally give you the reads on everything? Because I'm not going to want anybody to have 
um, a delay in their treatment because it's so important and you shouldn't have to be baking treats and, you know, sweet talking people to get that kind of care because everybody deserves that. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it, what it's going to look like. I know. I love it. Um, Dr. Likes, yeah, I would love your, yeah, your input. It's very interesting to hear both the patient side and the monitoring uh, mm -hmm. facility side, because I've had patients monitor, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, I've had patients in North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, um, mm -hmm and elsewhere. And it, it is, the key is the turnaround. Like Kristen was saying, it's not only on the patient side, you know, what they get their ultrasound results right away pretty much because they see it, but then the estradiol levels or whatever blood work, the HCG levels, you know, those are um, very um, anxiety provoking days. Mm -hmm. We are waiting on those two. And Kristen mentioned the facts and it's, it's sometimes after hours, because if there's a time delay from where they've been monitoring, there's that, that we have to deal with too, as does the patient. So it's very interesting to hear. And I appreciate Dr. Graham uh, knowing about the turnaround time. I know she does. And um, that's going to be key uh, for both us on our side. And then obviously getting the patient um, mm -hmm. information in terms of, yeah, the gone left, like you said, do we need to go up? Do we need to go down on the minute pure or whatever we're doing? So Mm -hmm. It's very, it's wonderful to hear this from both sides. And I appreciate it because we actually do outside monitoring at our, our office as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a quid pro quo. We understand that they want it quickly. And so I think the turnaround time is the, the biggest thing for, like you said, patient satisfaction and, and communication. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I also think that for me too, mm -hmm. like, and I mean, Dr. Lies, I think you know this about me though too, but it's like, I make connections with people. Like I don't want to go and be treated. And I think a lot of the women I work with too, like they want to go see the same person. And so like the, phlebo the phlebotomist I went to in Alabama, like at my actual practice, like became a friend, right? right? Cause like I saw her all the time. And so the, it took that level of stress of like, oh God, what is this beta result? Or what are you t finding out? Like by being able to see the same person over and over again really helps too. So one, there's the side of the speed and taking that stressor out, but then clearly I'm the infertility coach. I care about the emotional side too, and building that connection. And, you know, Dr. Likes, you're known for your bedside manner and Dr. Graham is providing that as well. Like that is an, ex that can be an extended service to know that like you're seeing the same person in a small practice. She's going to do it fast, but she's also going to be the same person that you're, you know, you're going to be seeing the same ultrasound tech. And to that end, you know, your point about being in an office with other pregnant women, um, people should know that this is an office that really the vision of it is to become kind of lots of things that women need from things like pelvic floor and physical therapy, um, things like that. So there, there isn't any other pregnancy services there. So, you know, if that's a trigger for people, as I would imagine it, it can be, um, you know, that that's not going to be sitting in the waiting room. It's also just not going to be that big of a place and that much traffic that there will in the hours that you'll be doing ultrasound that there'll be um, lots of people around, <laughs> um, which is the kind of nice private nature of it, I think. So, yeah. That's awesome. That's so good. Yeah. Now, Dr. Likes, have you um, done have you had patients where your outside monitoring is being done and there's things that make it harder other than just the time turnaround? Well, if it's at an office or a clinic that we're not um, used to, so to speak, and do they really know what they're looking at in terms of follicles? Because we, as you know, base a lot of our management on the follicular measurement. So what I'm talking about is measuring the ovaries, measuring the follicles where the eggs are. And we know based on millimeters if and estradiol levels, if we need to increase or decrease the dose. And so, yeah, I mean, there's some, sometimes that uncertainty if we've never dealt with the office before. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll be honest, most, mostly it's the time, uh, mm -hmm. turnaround time. And mm -hmm. we've been on the phone multiple times saying, where's my estradiol level or, or whatever the case may be, um, which, it, which happens, I think, anywhere. But um, it can be, as you can imagine, uh, stress-inducing for the patient if they don't hear from us by closing time. Um, but certainly, like um, we've just talked about, we're, we're going to get them in early, as, as I think everybody's alluded to. And, and usually the turnaround time is by lunch. Uh, yeah. But that's the biggest thing. If we're not certain of the other outside uh, facility, you know, how's the read going to be? Yeah. And to that end, I mean, this is something um, between, you know, from a patient aspect, just for people to know um, kind of what goes on with that ultrasound. It's funny, gynecologists and how we act is 
um, ultrasonographers and really like many radiologists within our like niche of a field, um, you know, you have someone that performs the ultrasound and then someone that reads it, you know, the sonographer usually a very good sonographer is essentially reading what you end up seeing yourself, um, which I have. Um, but um, with this whole process, I really we have a lot of technology behind um, the business as well, such that um, if it's the desire of the infertility clinic to be extremely hands-on and want to see those images, like I want to figure out ways to transmit those um, in a HIPAA compliant way and, and work with those clinics. So uh, from the patient aspect, we can read it like locally, I can read it and write down numbers and things to, to send to the infertility doctor to then make management decisions. But they also can hopefully have access to those images pretty quickly too. Um, just in the digital age, you know, we're just kind of harnessing all this technology and, um, you know, if, if people want that much more uh, or if their infertility doctor wants that much more hands-on um, power and then i'm fine with it so usually i mean usually doesn't come to that we we trust you and um <laughs> there is there is a technique to all of this as as with anything you know there are ultrasonographers that do 16 to 20 week anatomy scans on pregnant women and then there are ultrasonographers that do the follicle scans and they're vastly different so right. um as long as you know again the technique is there we, we trust you usually and i think Kristen alluded to earlier once they get closer to the time of potential retri egg retrieval or whatever we're doing, embryo transfer, then they'll probably come to us mm -hmm. for a couple of days, do the scans and get prepared. And then, mm -hmm. and then we'll do the procedure. That's usually how it works for us. Yeah. 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 That's, and that's what I did. I did as many as I could like close by locally to yeah. save myself from doing the drives. But cause like when I had to travel and again, this was my choice and for those of you listening, when you think sometimes of the hardships of infertility and what you're doing and what you're going through for IVF, it's like you have a choice on how you look at it. And I chose to go to a facility that I felt was better for me by driving. And so when I had to leave the house at 4 a.m., <laughs> like to get there, to be like the first patient they could see for monitoring so I could turn around and go back and show up at work and have nobody know, yeah. like that was, I told myself that that was a choice I was making and versus it being a burden and spending all of that time driving as like some burden and some, another level of stress. Um, so that's just something I want to make sure that people are taking away and knowing is like, you know, IVF is a challenge and is hard, but it also is a solution to help us become mothers when we've tried other things and it doesn't work. And the way you look at it makes a huge difference. Um, but I did want to talk about bedside manner and different doctor styles because, you know, some people go to their doctors and love their doctors and some people don't really know better or know what other options are. I've heard some really horrible stories and that's one of the reasons why I love being able to do this, to bring the good doctors up and promote them and encourage them. Um, but there are resources for anybody who is starting and looking for the doctor. Fertility IQ is an awesome website that you can rate your current doctor or a past doctor and you can look up reviews and resolve is another good resource. Um, but that's a good way, a place to start if you don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious from both of your point of views, like what you would encourage people to look for when they're going to a practice. I mean, from, from my end, I think people have two different viewpoints when they seek out a doctor, especially for really specialized care. And it, it um, tends to be that way in the surgical disciplines too. Like, you know, I have fibroids and I need a very specialized surgery and I want a robotic trained surgeon that knows what they're doing and has done a ton and, and that sort of thing. Um, and people may say, I don't, I don't care what their bedside manner is like, as long as they're good, you know, you, you hear that. And that's sometimes mm -hmm. what people want and, you know, great. Like then, um, then you're looking at stats and you're looking at, um, you know, maybe less reviews and maybe more of the technical stuff. Um, and then there are people that really, really need, um, someone to be more than just a, um, more than just someone that can help get them pregnant um, and somebody that um, is empathetic and um, 
understands a little bit about what they're going through, even if they haven't been through them themselves, because people like Dr. Likes, obviously, um, maybe could have been through it from the male perspective, but never the female perspective. And, um, and so, you know, just to have that, that empathy, um, you know, you know, patients know when you meet those types of doctors, I think, you know, that you click with them and you feel like you could ask them any question that comes off, um, your mind on any given day and that, you don't feel rushed out the door. And some people truly look for that. I think that's where as much as um, I was nervous about it, as it came out and became such a thing about online reviews, you know, reviewing your doctor, like your restaurant, <laughs> um, you know, I found they really, they do help uh, pull patients to me that are like-minded and are searching for something. I, I may not run perfectly on time. And in fact, I hardly ever do, but it's because when I'm in the room, I'm in the room and um you know, and so I think reviews can reflect that in terms of when patients are looking for a type of doctor, maybe that is the whole package. And that may not be um, in, some, in every person's area, things like what you do and seeking a coach that can walk you through that process if your options are sort of limited to um, uh, what you have in town, maybe because of insurance coverage or, or things like that, or it's impossible to travel. COVID is something you're not willing to travel for right now. Um, to have more people as a part of your squad to help you get through that process and to fill those gaps that maybe that awesome doctor that has amazing um, fertility rates isn't fulfilling in other ways, you know, in terms of the bedside leaner piece. So that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, I, I don't think I have much to add to Dr. Graham's response. That was perfect. I think the, the one thing I'll say is, and I'm, uh, we're not blind to it, every, you don't get along with everybody, right? And so mm -hmm. not every patient's going to like their primary, uh, their initial physician that they see. And I tell my new partners this same thing, you know, if they switch, it's nothing, typically, it's nothing that you did. It's just that, well, it's, it's not w the right combination. We get that. Um, and I was taught that long time ago from attending many, many, many years ago. So mm -hmm. We understand that and we want the right fit to be there because a lot of this is um, it, it's a lot of support uh, for what we do. So I think if you initially look at the clinics that maybe are closest to you or not even that, but the success rates that you like and then you meet the doctors, it's up to you to decide which one um, is the best fit. And, and we want that for you as well. Yeah. And I decided to become an infertility coach because I was realizing when I was a patient that I needed a lot of, I wanted their time so much. And I was like, but I felt guilty, like taking up their time, but then I still wanted more. And I was like, this could be the solution because the doctors have a lot on their plates. Like they have a lot of patients to see. There's a lot of parts and pieces. I mean, Dr. Likes with all the workshops you've done with us and how much you've shared, like there are parts and pieces we still don't even know about. Um, even though you did the behind the scenes kind of last <laughs> month with us. And, um, so being able to take that off of the doctor's plate to say, Hey, I'm going to focus on my zone of genius as being your infertility doctor, but you can go to these resources to help you with that other area of support you need, whether that's nutrition or acupuncture or therapy or coaching or whatever, you know, it's nice to know that there are options to add on. It's almost like your own menu, right? You get to pick what you get to pick and add on what fits your needs. And, um, like you said, you might not jive as well with the doctor, but like their labs might be awesome or their stats might be really good. A lot of times I have clients who talk about the nurses and sometimes the nurses respond to them in such a rushed way that they like then categorize the whole practice based yes. on getting an email from a nurse that doesn't answer their question. And it's like, you know, that's one person in a whole practice. And I hate when a doctor then is judged based on the nurse's email, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the nurses are a person too. They might just be having a bad day and an off day. And so I do, when I'm working with clients, I don't encourage them to like jump ship. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of women, when they have a failed cycle, they're like, I've got to find a new clinic. I've got to find a new doctor. And I don't believe that that's the answer necessarily. What I do care about, and I think you, I hope you guys agree is about advocating for yourself and what you need and want and, and having the relationship with the doctor that fits your needs. Like sometimes you want the back and forth to discuss your next step with a doctor. And sometimes you just want to be told what to do and not even think about the other options. Right. Yeah. Yeah, 
I think it really just isn't about empowering. Like um, Mm -hmm. that's what I'm big on in my practice is just empowering through knowledge about the choices you have and um, that you get to be in the, this is the one area maybe in the time when you have very little control over things that you get to be in the driver's seat in terms of um, who you want um, helping you through the process. So ideally you get the whole package, you know, but in reality, you said, we're all human beings and there people have bad days. And uh, fortunately, you know, there, there are options. We, we were chatting a little bit and you mentioned resolve earlier, which is a advocacy group I'd never heard of, but just in researching a little bit about, um, different clinics and things like that just kind of came across. And, and we were just talking prior to the, the chat about, um, and maybe Dr. Likes, you can comment if you think this is true, but they, they grade each state based on um, several factors and kind of give them a report card score, but it was number of fertility doctors per women that are seeking treatment. And both North and South Carolina was about one infertility doctor per 10,000 women. So, you know, you may be amazing, but like- You can't, <laughs> you can't see 10,000 people. So, um, there's yeah. still always gonna be some people looking and searching, you know, um, outside just for simply that reason um, too, I think, you know, um, or wait times. That's something I think pretty common here. And in, in, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. And if we didn't say that earlier um, and, you know, I've just, it's in, something increasing I've heard from, from patients as we've lost a few providers in town, just how wait times have increased and they're frustrated, you know, um, because when you're ready, you're ready and you want to get in. And um, especially this time of year too, I think is, yeah. It's time when people are, are ready, you know, to make that next step. But, yeah. <laughs> so is that, I have to ask, I, I don't know if I know that number. Is that one per 10,000 reproductive age patients, <laughs> women, or uh-huh. is that one in 10,000 of the population? I think she, that, yeah, yeah. she was just looking up when we were talking ahead yeah. of time. But at North Carolina it has that there's 34 fertility specialists in North Carolina. Um, and then there's um, women in the state regardless of marital status who are experiencing difficulty in getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to live birth. And it's 300,000 women. So wow. that's about okay. 10, yeah. 000. and then about the same for less um, overall volume of population. It says there's 14 fertility specialists in South Carolina. I don't know if that sounds about right. That's about right. Yeah. That sounds about right. That's shocking to me. Like that's something I never had any idea of, but until really recently. Yeah. Well, I think what you're doing is going to, um, ki- no pun intended, but connect everybody even better, <laughs> quite honestly, Yeah. in all honesty, because it's going to break down those barriers. Because for instance, I've, you know, we have satellite offices in surrounding areas here, but it, if we were seeing them in person, they would have to wait a couple of weeks to see us because we weren't there every day. Whereas now telemedicine, I mean, shoot, they can see us within 24 to 48 hours on telemedicine. So I think it is closing that gap, hopefully. Um, but um, you're right. There is a need. And, and for patients that are probably maybe new to that process and maybe don't understand what people can actually do, you can choose. So uh, I've heard patients say two different versions. One might be the most, um, you do as much local as you can. You literally telemedicine with someone like Dr. Likes or your, you know, REI of choice, you go through the whole consultation, you know, from how long you've been trying and what workup's been done and here's what still needs to be done and kind of get all that information back and then however many other consultations you have. And then you're basically sort of trusting the local OBGYN that's already examined and, um, and done those stages, you know, um, physical exam and and sent that information and like literally meet people virtually, you know, in this day and age, which for some, I think they don't want that. They want to meet you like in the flesh. And so would drive for that initial consult, but it's, either that if people want it or that in between, you know, surrounding kind of go time of the procedural based stuff with the labs and ultrasounds. But then after um, procedures are completed, then, you know, um, and hopefully there's a positive outcome and being monitored as long as um, infertility docs on see a wide range with different ones I've come in contact with of how long they like to um, keep them sort of in their, um, um, care before releasing to the general OBGYN. Um, so they can continue to kind of have those follow-up ultrasounds, making sure they have a healthy pregnancy. So can be done locally. Yeah. yeah. I've been amazed, um, from the, uh, the push for telehealth, uh, because of the pandemic. I mean, it's just heightened now. Right. And, um, yeah. 
I had a patient a couple of weeks ago. The, the first time I met her in person was at her first pregnant OB ultrasound after we did a few cycles. That was the first time I ever met her. Otherwise, yeah. it was just on the computer. Now, I don't yeah. advocate for that. I'm just saying that's that has happened. And, and you're right. I mean, we do trust the primary OBs that uh, or OBGYNs that see them. I mean, I'm, I'm very trusting of those folks know how to do labs and, and exams, right? And so it's amazing how much you can do initially virtually and then lab work elsewhere at monitoring visits like mm -hmm. you're talking about and still formulate a plan that can um, not push a pause button too long and still help us do this from a um, right. far reaching monitoring kind of um, uh, uh, scenario. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. I, I just, when, as soon as I heard about it, Dr. Graham, I was like, this is amazing. And I just feel like they should be all over <laughs> the place too. That. I guess typically for people maybe that don't live in Charlotte or surrounding areas, like, you know, look, local REIs may do the same thing or OBGYN mm -hmm. offices. I think, you know, in those practices, one of the things is just it, they're busy already. And so it's sometimes hard. I've known some that only take a certain number per month, you know, locally with COVID. I think um, some of the local places stopped doing it here, um, which was something I found out after I started, but then it was even more of a reason, you know, that I was glad. Um, I ultimately decided to to move forward with this idea. So um, yeah, those are other resources though to look at if you're not in Charlotte or you know for whatever reason you're looking for those places. That's that's where to find them. Yeah. Well, and Dr. Likes, what you were talking about, just the acceptance. I think of you know technology and being able like I mean we're doing this on Zoom, right? This was originally yes. going to be in a bar and it's now on Zoom, but it gives us that ability to reach more people and eliminate other barriers like, you know, driving and traveling and keeping people safe. You yeah. know, I, I coach women all over. All of my coaching is done over Zoom or phone calls yeah. and people are more comfortable with that because of just this, we've had this like insane progression of getting pushed it in our face this year. Right. Um, but even when I was doing it before, it was like, okay, guys, like this is how it works. Yeah. So I do love that there's a level of comfort. And even on the doctor side, I mean, I have some doctors that are older and doing telehealth and that stuff. It was like, I would have never trusted that they could do that. And, <laughs> you know, I think that I'm glad yeah. that there's this level of education about it. Yeah. I mean, I said it a long time ago, you know, I mean, Dr. Graham probably remembers when you're in med school, the, the thing was go see the patient. Right. And so now seeing the patient is just virtual, but it's just, a, it's an amazing acceptance that we have now. And I think patients have really appreciated um, it as well, because I see, you know, my eight o'clock patients, I'll see it starting at 745 probably. And I'm on the telehealth with them there and on their couch at their house, I'm in my office, but they love it. I mean, it's just easy. Um, and it's like you said, the, the drive, getting off work necessarily, those sorts of things, the couple mm -hmm. are there together. So it, it's kind of amazing how this has evolved uh, from the, and I hope it I hope it sticks around. I know with insurance coverage for other aspects of telehealth is is kind of up in the air. But I guess the good thing is if you don't have any IVF coverage, you know, then your doctors can still choose to do this if you're having to pay out of pocket. You know, um, that's the one nice part about it. I guess when we're looking for positives, but yeah, it certainly has increased compliance too. I think, and and you know, you probably don't have that problem at all. But um, compliance with like um, following up for like mental health, say people I find are more apt to just go head out to their car on their lunch break and, and sign into their virtual visit. And so I think it's increased access too. So, yeah. Is there anything that either one of you want to sort of summarize or say that didn't get to say related to sort of outside monitoring, getting the support you need and different ways it looks and. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just, like kind of summarize, I guess, with a lot of people being out of state, just, you know, advocate for yourselves and look for those resources. Don't be afraid to ask for them. Don't be afraid that you're going to uh, make your in-town REI angry if you ask, you know, will you monitor me? Because you usually have to call and ask, like if it's something they do, um, you know, just ask, um, you know, take the bull by the horn and, and sort of do that. Um, you know, there doesn't look like too many people in nearby me, but if you do are interested in services um, through Connected and the local monitoring I'm able to provide here in Charlotte, 
people can find me through my website and I've made it pretty simple. Just my name, heathergrammd.com. And there's a little tab that says connected um, up top that people can click on to uh, reach out. Uh, best way to, if you're needing an appointment to reach out is just to email me at the present moment and there'll be better technology to book services um, online in the future. So. That's awesome. Cause I was going to ask you, how do people reach you? So I'm glad you gave the website. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Likes? Yeah, I mean, I don't have uh, much more other than to say, I don't think location needs to be a, a deterring factor anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I've had patients in Texas monitor and then they fly over for the transfer. I have one in Ohio right now flying down soon for her transfer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's it, location should not be a, a deterrent. And with folks like Dr. Graham, it's only getting better, I think. So um, I, I'm very interested to see how connected goes because maybe we can start something somewhere else for that um, <laughs> because I think it would be um, ideal for our patients. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and like she said, be your own advocate. So uh Look us up on, online, I guess, because we have a very savvy, tech savvy uh, patient population. They're, they they know they can go online and find us and find all the rates. And so I'm not really um, worried about them doing that, but uh, don't let location be a deterrent. Yeah, and everybody on Facebook, in my Facebook group is from all over. So um, while everybody who's joining us live right now is more close except for Sacramento, California. The Facebook group is a big group too. So I love, I just, um, I, I have to talk about this with my clients a lot, but you are worth speaking up for what you want. You are not the most high maintenance patient asking for whatever it is you are asking for. You are paying a lot of money, whether it's you or your insurance company, this is a lot of money. And um, the doctors can't read your mind. They don't know better. And if there's something that could make your experience through their practice better, give them the chance before you start, you know, taking the one bad experience to like tarnish everything else. Um, I think that that's really important to keep in mind. And um, so I just want people to know that. Um, I did see a question that came in though. Um, so it says, I'm new to this group. I feel like I'm missing the mental health side of my infertility journey. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, um, you know, I'll jump right into that. <laughs> so um, as you mentioned in the intro, like I'm really passionate about women's mental health too, as I know you are too, Kristen is obviously why she started what she did. And so um I think just recognizing that is like key, like step one, like you realize there's something missing instead of just soldiering on and sort of, um, you know, thinking this is just how it's supposed to be. And you're just going to have to get through it. So acknowledging that you do need some more help is like the bravest thing you can do. And then the next hardest step, I think is just finding what your resources are locally. So if you're near South Carolina, um, she had, Kristen has an awesome business that I've learned about through her of, of what she does in coaching people. So one of the things she described to me about what she does was that, you know, support groups are amazing, um, for a lot of aspects of mental health. Um, but one of the things Kristen mentioned was just in some of her support groups, as different people got pregnant, there was sometimes some, um, you know, some jealousy that naturally kind of comes into play as people were having positive outcomes and some people were having negative outcomes. And so unlike other support groups, maybe for anxiety or depression um, or new motherhood or, or things like that, um, cancer survivors, things, it, people's journeys tend to be maybe on somewhat similar paths um, versus how they can sometimes diverge in this arena. So having uh, they certainly can be very valuable, but having a one-on-one -on -one person, whether it be a counselor or um, a life coach or um, someone very specific, and I think there's a few of them, but they do exist, um, specific to that arena are, are crucial. Um, and then hopefully myself, like I, I do a lot in the mental health arena and treatment and medications, and it's something that um, there are there's, I actually have a certification in perinatal mental health. So I would include this as very much part of it, even though you're not pregnant, you're perinatal. So it means just surrounding pregnancy. So you're, you're trying to accomplish that. So, um, postpartum support international actually has listed. And I know that sounds postpartum. You should only look at that if you've had a baby, but it's, it's sort of just an advocacy group for all mental health, um, um, aspects surrounding pregnancy. And so you can actually look up providers in your area that, um, maybe have certifications, counselors, or 
um, that type of thing. And, and you may know more, Kristen, about um, infertility groups. I get asked that a lot. And unfortunately, sometimes I'm like Facebook groups, I think, or like what I'm hearing in terms of support groups, um, counselors, I would reach out to, you know, your most trusted doctor and ask for a recommendation locally. Yeah. And I will just add, because I'm, I'm one of those solutions as an infertility coach. Um, the difference between the coaching and therapy is something I get asked a lot about mm -hmm. is coaching is more about looking at your present and trying to work towards a goal and looking ahead. Um, so it's not trying to fix and heal from like past traumas and things that have happened in the past. I actually work with a lot of clients who do both. So again, it's part of that squad. I love the term that you said, Dr. Graham, about the squad. Yeah. It was like, I pull that from someone. Yeah. Okay. But it's like <laughs> this team of people and like, we yeah. all need our own team and we all need support in different areas, just like athletes yeah. do, right? Mm -hmm. They might have a personal trainer and they might have a dietitian and a nutritionist and a chef and, um, <laughs> hairstylist and all the above, but like, um, this is just one of those options. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And that is something that I did because like Dr. Graham said, I think everybody's journey, though, we have a lot of things that are similar. There's different aspects and it's unique. Um, even Dr. Likes talks about that, about like treatment. It's like, it is individualized and coaching offering it one-on-one -on -one is individualized. There's so much power in being around people who understand are going through the same thing, which is why I do the support group after this. So stay and come every month. I don't care if you come for the beginning part, just come for the support group if that's what you really need, because that is a resource for you. Resolve offers monthly support groups. They used to be in person. They're now virtual. Mm -hmm. It's harder to do it virtually. Yes. Like it's face-to-face -face is way better. Um, but in this day and age, we have to acclimate ourselves and just figure out what we can do and what's the best option. And so that's an option. So I offer the support group, but then I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching so that you have a safe space. So you can talk about the coworker that asked you the really stupid question of when you're going to have a baby and you don't have to hide about how you're jealous because your sister's pregnant again, and you're not like I, and also the Facebook groups are wonderful and amazing. My concern with them and the reason why I made my own is I'm not in the trenches. I'm not trying. When I was going through, I didn't want to be around somebody else who was also trying because they were high and low. They were feeling good some days and they were feeling bad some days and they would disappear. And so I'm the constant. This is my job. This is my career. This is my purpose in life. I am here. I am present. I'm not trying. I'm not going to have an oops baby or anything like that. Like I'm done. And I'm here to stand at the top of the hill and walk you up as you climb this hill, um, as you get over it, but with the support team of your infertility doctor and other areas that you need for anybody who's curious about coaching I do free calls. They're an hour long and you get so much out of it where we talk about like what's going on in your journey and what the challenges are and where I can help and what's making it harder on you. And then we can talk about if one-on-one -on -one coaching is right for you. So I invite you to set up a call with me. I would love to talk to you to find out more. And if it's not coaching or if it's not me, just like they were saying like, there's other coaches I can refer you to. There are other, there's therapists that do specialize in infertility who've gone through the trenches, who understand the terminology like I do. So I hope that helps answer. And I'm glad you're here because this is exactly where you need to be. Okay, that was, <laughs> that was my little spot. So thank you for asking, that was amazing. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Graham for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Likes, for being here month after month. This was so helpful. I hope people like that. I'm curious about people's perspective of the difference of the conversation versus the, you know, lecture style. Um, so I'll probably put that in a survey in the replay <laughs> email to find out. So give me your opinion when you're watching. I want to know what you think. And um, Dr. Graham, thank you for being here. Thank you for what you're creating and the services you're providing. I think it's it's clear that it's amazing and it's awesome. And the women in Charlotte are very lucky to have that as an option for you. <laughs> Dr. Likes, thank you for being here month after month for starting this with me and for being the doctor that you are that is helping women become moms. So it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And everybody else stay on and we'll do the support group part. So thank you.